what you're working on, Mrs. Beasley. You made this beautiful footstool for Mr. French? Because you know he likes polka dots? And you even dressed up nice for him in polka dots. Wow, you really do want him to become Mr. Beasley, don't you? I don't see how he can turn you down now. This is awesome. Let's go see, let's go give it to him, okay? Oh no, he's already got one just like it. Oh, Mrs. Beasley. Welcome to Living Figuratively. This is the 24th episode, if you can believe it, with your host, Judy Takas, me. Um, this week's episode, this Living Figuratively, is the show that asks the question, why not fill your home with the faces and figures of people that you don't even know? Why not fill your home with figurative art? Each week, I take you to a corner of my house or my studio and show you my work or the work of other artists and basically tell you how you can live with it, love it, and enjoy having figurative art as part of your life, living figuratively. Last week, um, we started an episode called Unsolved Family History, Unsolved Mystery. And I finished it with a minor mystery, which was the name of the artist and the origin of this painting of my grandmother, which has worked out to be in my collection. As luck would have it, this past weekend was Labor Day weekend, and we had a super, super rainy Labor Day. So instead of holing up in my studio and painting like I do on all the other days, um, I decided to do something different. I decided to go through my photo albums and like work on my photo albums. Right now I'm about 10 photo albums, but I also have a big stash of photos that I inherited from my parents and from my grandparents because they all ended up in the pile that my sister and I split when we cleaned out my parents' house. As luck would have it, when I was going through those photos, look what I found. I was pretty darn psyched. My grandmother, Ever the Planner, had taken a picture of the portrait and on it she labeled in her little Hungarian cursive, she labeled it with the name of the painter. And his name is, he's a Hungarian painter named Bertalan Vig. And he was born, I Googled him, so like I found out a little bit more about him. And fortunately he is, he does have a slight internet presence. There's no Wikipedia page or anything, but he had some pieces up for auction a few years ago and they were already sold, but I printed out some pictures of them. And he's quite, quite an accomplished artist. 1890 to 1946, here's one. Here was another one that I found, which I thought was quite interesting. And then here's the third one that I found that I thought was pretty darn good. I still believe though that the best one that I've seen of his is the one of my grandmother. And I'm very uh, happy that she inspired such a beautiful portrait. Um, and that she had the intelligence and taste to pick a really good artist to do her portrait. Um, so I'm glad it's part of my collection. I'm still not going to clean it. And now I don't need to take it anywhere because I found out who the artist was. So now on to the real, the big unsolved mystery, the big unsolved family mystery that um, I touched upon last week. At this point in the show, um, when I start referring to grandmother. I'm actually not referring to this grandmother anymore. I'm referring to the grandmother on my dad's side. And I'm going to show you a painting I did of her when I was back in art school. Um, this painting, it's an oil painting, but I did it while I was under the influence of Bert Silverman's Breaking the Rules of Watercolor book which um, has basically, this was like 1978, this book came out and I think I probably bought it in 1982 or so. Um, it has profoundly affected the way I paint and um, 
And, uh, and one of the paintings from this book that particularly inspired my painting of my grandmother was this one called The Signora, where I just loved how he did her creepy arms and her homemade dress. She just, it, this, this embodies my grandmother's spirit because my grandmother, this grandmother, my dad's dad, was, um, she was a sturdy, strong peasant woman, kind of a, the kind that you picture, because she did this all the time, kneading dough, like, you know, with her big, strong arms and cutting down trees, which she did actually cut down a tree in her backyard. I'm not sure exactly why, but she did. She was that type of woman. And, um, and I feel like in painting this painting, she didn't pose for many photographs at all. Uh, and this came from a tiny Polaroid that I had taken with a Polaroid camera from the 1970s that I had. Um, so I'm always still working from my own reference. But I feel like this really did embody her, her strong, big Hungarian spirit. And she lived with us the whole time growing up. So I really did get to see her a lot without necessarily knowing a lot about her story, which leads me back to, I'm gonna come back over here to the painting that we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, this painting, it's called Titkosh Testveer, The Secret Sister Who Was Sent Away. This painting is a painting of her daughter, who is my dad's sister. Um, we know nothing of her. We don't have any photographs of her. We don't have any birth certificates. We don't have any death certificates. We d there's, there's literally no proof that she even existed, except for, except for the family story that was told to us when we were kids. Um, and when you're kids and you get told this sort of simple one-liner, one-sentence family story, you sort of... This is, it's a foregone conclusion. It becomes part of your history and you can repeat this one sentence very easily. Um, it's kind of like when you're taught in history class that, you know, Columbus was this fun explorer who sailed the ocean blue and then he discovered America because nobody had discovered it before. There was nobody here already. And, um, and also, you know, myths like that the Civil War wasn't about slavery, it was about economics. So these one-liners kind of get into the back of your brain and you don't really even think about them anymore, aside from the fact that there are all kinds of nuances and actual people behind these stories that, you know, that have very complex stories of their own and sometimes they're the exact opposite of what the simple one-liner story is. So our simple one-liner story that we grew up with was that my dad had a sister and his sister died right around the same time that his father died and that was right at the beginning of the Second World War. So that was the, that was the story we grew up with. Um, there was more to it, obviously. My mom actually interviewed my dad and wrote about a little bit more about the story in her book. She wrote this book, which is, has been this invaluable source of information about our family. It's called Our Story, the, Hungar the Story of a Hungarian-American Family. And so what more we know about her is in this book, um, which isn't a whole lot. So apparently, this, here's, the, here's how the, the story goes. My dad was born in a Hungarian village almost 100 years ago, um, and my dad has passed away since, uh, the Hungarian village of Muglod. His mother and father and his sister all lived in this Hungarian village. His sister was older than he was, but we don't know exactly when she was born. We don't know exactly how old, how much older. And, um, and she was, she, there were, there were troubles because she had epilepsy apparently. And, um, there, it, his grandmother owned a general store in town or in this rural, rural town. And his father was very, was very ill. He, uh, you know, eventually had to quit, 
quit working and I don't know if he was bedridden, but he wasn't able to work anymore at a certain point. Um, in the meantime, my dad, who you may have you know, heard me mention before, he was a mathematician, uh, uh, he, a, p a pioneer of queuing theory, which is a major thing in mathematics. Um, and even at a very young age, my grandmother recognized that, you know, he had a big, good propensity for, um, for math. And so he started going, commuting from this rural Hungarian village into Budapest, 16 miles every day by train, uh, when he was very young, when he was like 13 or 12. And um, it, that going to that special school in Budapest costs a lot of money. And so my grandmother, we had to continue to support the family by running the family store. So her daughter, Maria, here with her epilepsy, which this was the late 1920s in Hungary, there weren't medications for it. There, it was a debilitating disease, essentially, for her, and she required constant care. And then when my uh, grandmother's husband, my dad's father, became ill, it just pushed everything to the wall, essentially. And my grandmother was not able to take care of everything um, all, all by herself, essentially. Now, this would have been the logical time, because it was a Hungarian village, it would have been the logical time for my dad to quit his schooling and stay home, work, on the, work on the, uh, at the store, you know, help his dad, help his sister, like, you know, because people quit their schooling at 12, 13, 14 back then. But my grandmother would have sooner cut off her arm than let her brilliant son stop his schooling. So in order to continue to support that, she needed to continue to be the family breadwinner and keep the store going. And in order for that to happen, Maria, her daughter, had to be sent away. So she was sent away, and according to the story the, that, that was passed down, she was sent to another village to live with relatives. If somebody is debilitatingly ill and debilitatingly, like, really hard to take care of, I'm not sure whether there are relatives in other villages that would want to assume that burden, but that was the story. Now, we don't know. Could this have been a euphemism for being institutionalized? Um, back then, in 19, early 1930s Hungary, uh, being institutionalized, I can't even imagine the horrors of what that would be, especially if you have this disease that that causes seizures and might look like insanity and might look like, you know, whatever. I, I don't even know. I can only imagine restraints and sedation and horrible, you know, situations. I mean, I hope that that's not the situation, but unless we get a three-eyed raven, we really may never know because I feel like I've looked through all our family records and I really can't find anything more about Maria. Um, apparently she died at the age of 21 and it's, I don't know how long she was sent away versus how long she was at home and I don't know what she died from. We, there's no death certificate that says, you know, this is what she had when she died. Uh, so that's also, that's also a mystery. Um, and I owe a huge debt of gratitude to her and I, I don't condemn my grandmother for her decision to send her away because the fact that she sacrificed one child for the, you know, winning pony, I guess, in the family, my dad, um, meant that every single other person yet to come in the family ended up with a better life. The fact that my dad was able to continue his education allowed him to become the brilliant mathematician that he was, which was his ticket out of uh, war-torn Hungary and, you know, communist-controlled Hungary. It's what enabled him to go to um, Columbia with my mom, Columbia University with my mom as his wife and be a professor there. It's what enabled my sister and myself to be born in the United States, which contrary to, you know, what, what's going on, it's I have huge, huge hope that we will become, truly become great again. Um, it's what helped everybody for all the generations yet to come, but sacrificed, sacrificed one. So I owe her a huge debt of gratitude. 
And there's a there's a quote by uh, it's an it's an old Jewish quote or by Banksy or by Herman Taub. I think different people have uh, claimed that quote as their own. Um, it's you you die two times: once when you actually stop breathing, and a second time when your name is uttered for the last time. So. I am officially starting the clock again on my secret aunt, Maria Takach, and I am doing it, do it, doing it via paint. So for this painting of this person who I didn't have a photograph of and knew nothing about, uh, what I decided to do was I found a female model who kind of looked like my dad at that same age because I figured that there would be a family resemblance. So this was my dad at 18 and I found Jordan Serpentini who is actually a, she's a figure model, but in addition to that, she's a skateboard artist. She is a talented musician and she's a Reiki artist and she's just an all round beautiful soul. And um, I loved having her over for the photo shoot to do this because we really talked about, you know, uh, Maria and who she was and what we didn't know and um, it was it was a really nice it was a good experience so how did I stage her for this photo for this the photo reference for this painting uh, basically I went digging through the few things that we had left over from my grandmother to see what I could put together to do something that looked a little bit like a historical portrait but definitely of today. So one of the things that I found was a crocheted shawl that my grandmother had made for me when I was a little girl. It's kind of little for a little girl, but so I gave Maria that thinking that she might have crocheted something for her own daughter. I found a bohemian purse that I already had and I doctored it up and I made it a little, a little more Hungarian. Um, because I figured she'd be sent off with a, a satchel to, you know, carry her things in. I was a uh, good Catholic, so she would probably send her daughter off with the trappings of the faith. Um, so I had one of her uh, rosary beads. In fact, in my grandmother's possessions, it was a very, very few possessions. There were like six rosary beads, so I picked the prettiest one. Um, she would have sent her daughter off with a uh, change purse full of um, forints and fillers, which are Hungarian money, and uh, maybe to keep her caregivers happy. I don't know. So that's why I have the change purse up in the, uh, in the painting. Um, I also, I figured she might have knit, knit some mittens for her. These are mittens that my grandmother knit for me when I was little or maybe for my sister I can't remember because our hands were this little so we didn't remember that but uh, it was among her possessions so I um, I put that I put that in there and one of the things that I constructed was this little letter um, I constructed a letter that there were some letters from to and from my grandmother to different people there was no letter to her daughter because this, you know, if, if she had written a letter, it would have been sent away. Um, but I constructed this letter on my painting where I collaged together the words Edesh Maria, which means sweet Maria, um, which would have been the words that she would have written to, you know, dear, dear, her, her dear daughter when she was writing to her. And so I, I, you know, constructed that as a as an as another detail hanging from the um, from the painting, and um, oh yes, and I had an old Hungarian Bible that I gave her because I figured she would have sent her off with a with a Hungarian Hungarian Bible. Um, anyway, so that is that is my painting Titkoshtestvér, which means secret sister. Uh, it's all about my secret aunt, Maria Takac. And um, I want to thank you all for joining me tonight for Living Figuratively. Next week, be sure to come back because next week I'm going to take you down and dirty into the rafters, talking all about the art of studio storage. Same bad time, same bad channel, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time 
on Thursday. And, oh yes. Oops, wait a second. <laughs> I do it in the wrong order. Oh yes. Tell Cersei I want her to know it was me.